there's an immediate need for action on the ground, what is your plan post 2024 in order to utilize that action, that fervor that's in a lot of people that are putting their trust into you electorally? Great. And let me just preface that with just a word about the plan before the election, because the, uh, you know, the conventional wisdom is that we are just little people and we are just, you know, on the margins, that we're not the power holders, you know, but I think that's BS and yeah. it's more BS than it has ever been before. Uh, I think the power is more in our hands than it has ever been to really overthrow this system of empire and oligarchy who's just, you know, uh, a disaster. This is a disaster in terms of national policy. It's a disaster in terms of its cost here at home. Um, the American people are done th being thrown under the bus and the, uh, the pump is really primed for a big transition and people are clamoring for that, especially with these two zombie candidates <laughs> rammed down our throats. It's like, yeah. it's the perfect storm to stand up and demand what the American people are demanding now. And, you know, this is kind of across the political spectrum. I would like to introduce Green Party presidential candidate for president of the United States, Dr. Jill Stein joins me here today for the first time on the channel. Welcome, so good to have you. So great to be with you finally. I've been watching you from afar, so it's great to actually be one-on-one uh, -on -one here. <laughs> She had the binoculars on. She was like, hey, there's that guy over there. <laughs> so Dr. Stein, um, I just want to, you know, this is your first time on my channel speaking with me, especially in regards to your presidential run. Uh, of course, as we know, uh, we are, let me see, March, April, May, June, July. So about seven, seven months away from the actual election that's going to be going on in regards to, you know, the running of this country and you're running right now. Uh, quite a, a I, I would say, not an assertive campaign to really get on the ballot. And one of the first questions that I had is in regards to ballot access, um, looking at one, uh, looking at your website, um, Currently, as of March 25th, you had uh, you have ballot access right now in 20 states, and you're actively petitioning in 23 right now. Uh, by you know, if you were to get all of them within the allotted time, you would have 43 states. Uh, what is some of your biggest obstacles in your view in getting more attention and eyes on your campaign? So let me just also add that there are several states in which you. Uh, can't run yet, uh, but we will be running for them all. So we are on track to be a 50 state campaign plus uh, DC. So you could say a 51 state campaign because it should be a state. Um, but that's our presumption. And we were on the ballot in 47 states in 2016 and for 97% of voters. And um, our, we are on track right now to be on all of those ballots. And and your question there, James, uh, you wanted to know like sort of what's our, what's the thrust of our campaign? What what was your first uh, question there? Uh, the first question was really, um, you know, what is the biggest obstacles in your view in getting more attention and eyes on your campaign? <laughs> so, you know, there's kind of a blanket uh, suppression campaign going on to undermine uh, political competition because the parties of war on Wall Street, I think they recognize their days are numbered and that they have lost uh, popular support. And certainly the Democratic Party has lost its base, having thrown working people under the bus for um, quite some time now. Uh, and their base has been badly eroded. 2010, they lost 1,000 seats in state legislatures. They lost 64 seats in Congress. They lost uh, 14 uh, Senate seats and 12 governorships. You know, so they've really been kind of on the defensive uh, for quite a while. Yeah. And and they try to blame it on third parties, but of course there were no third parties in 2010 when they had their biggest wipeout ever. So you know that's what this is about. Their base 
uh, is moving on because people are tired of being thrown under the bus. Um, but they are doing everything in their power. In fact, you know, they announced recently article in the New York Times just a couple days ago that they are hiring an army of corporate lawyers to try to, um, you know, keep us off the ballot, to try to find technicalities, to throw us out. Um, and they've also announced, this wasn't in the Times, but another article about this, announced that they would be, you know, uh, trying to highlight the unsavory aspects of our character, they said, uh, you know, aka smear campaigns, you know, this is like not new. This is what they always do. And their effort to throw Matthew Ho off the ballot. He was running for Senate as a Green in, I think it was 2020 or it was 2022, I think. Yeah. And, you know, they made the mistake. They, they were impersonating Greens and calling people who had signed the petitions, asking them to please request to have their names taken off. And they made the mistake of calling the chair uh, one of the co-chairs of the North Carolina Green Party. And he recorded the conversation. It's hysterical. We will be promoting that again, just to show people what to expect when the Democrats say that they are trying to complicate our ballot access uh, campaigns. This is what they do. You know, they resort to dirty tricks because they know that they're defeated already from the get-go, that the American people really uh, are done. They're done being thrown under the bus in the way that they are by both political parties. The Democrats have pretended to be the lesser evil for quite some time, but um, they're not, you know, and uh, even when they've had a trifecta controlling the White House and the Congress, they're serving their Wall Street masters, you know, which is what happened in, in 2008 with the big crash, um, uh, the crash of the economy and the Wall Street bailouts while homeowners got thrown out, you know. So in, in a nutshell, the powers that be are trying to silence their competition. So there are inordinate uh, hoops to jump through, but we've done it before and uh, we're in the process of doing it now. And I encourage people, if you want to fight the power, if you want to overturn oligarchy and uh, empire that go hand in hand, um, join, you know, check us out. Go to jillstein2024.com because we have a big team. People are really mobilized this time around for all kinds of reasons. Uh, the numbers of people that are clamoring for an independent party are off the charts uh, at a record high. Uh, the number of people who identify as independent of the two uh, Wall Street parties is twice as many as the number who identify as either Democrat or Republican. And our lives are just really a series of converging crises right now. You know, who's not in crisis? Do you know anyone who's not in crisis in some way right now, whether it's student debt, whether it's the cost of health care? Um, you know, and by the way, uh, Joe Biden, like Barack Obama, have been very busy privatizing Medicare. So, um, you know, the one system that we have that that's really the best and the model for what should be generalized to everyone, they've been on the attack there and serving the interests of pharmaceutical companies and big insurers. 63% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. Half of renters are struggling just to keep a roof over their heads and are severely financially stressed. Um, you know, and there they are. They're very busy giving away the, the store. They just, you know, passed this budget, this 2024 um, fiscal year budget, which in fact is uh, 60 some percent uh, for either war or uh, m militarized uh, programs in, in sort of military uh, and policing and security. That's where our dollars are going, you know, and there's just, and they say there's not enough dollars to keep children out of poverty or to help provide affordable housing and the things that we desperately need, but they've got all the money in the world um, for the next war and for genocide, in fact. And the bill that was just passed is really a child starvation bill. It's absolutely outrageous. Uh, it appropriates like $3.8 billion for Israel and this continuing um, genocidal assault. But there's another bill, you know, for $17 billion that will provide even more resources for Israel to continue conducting this war uh, in the Middle East. So, you know, just making the point here, I'm, I'm expanding into several other topics I'm sure we'll get to. But to make the point, the American people are, are done being thrown under the bus, which is why the powers that be, the ruling parties are trying to, um, uh, you know, to basically eliminate us and to 
uh, bury us in, uh, you know, they're trying to disappear us in so many words. They don't want people to know that they have other options. And then they try to smear uh, voters who want to stand up and vote on their own behalf instead of taking marching orders that you're supposed to be good little boys and girls and keep throwing, keep voting for the predators that are voting, throwing you under the bus. People are done with that and ready to move on. Yeah, of course. I mean, one of the things that has been one of the biggest gripes, especially with a lot of us, and uh, I, what a, a lot of us when I'm speaking of is those of us who are poor and working poor. Because a lot of times people put the emphasis on, for instance, the middle class. Oh, the middle class of our country. And people leave people like myself who are, are working poor and disabled out. The people who are working as janitors, people who are working as people who are behind the counter at a Wendy's, right? Mm -hmm. These are the people who really are harmed in our country. I, you know, I'm not sure if you have noticed, but um, I'm right now personally in a crisis because mm -hmm. my landlord is literally selling mm -hmm. the place where I live yeah. and they're going to give us only 60 days to leave. I myself am disabled. I'm on kidney dialysis. I go to dialysis three mm -hmm. days a week. My mom is 72 years old and she's elderly and mm -hmm. she and I really don't have anywhere to go right now. Mm -hmm. And so because of what we're going through, I am just a microcosm of what's really going on in this country. And so I'm saying all that to say a TikTok ban. Really? That's one of my biggest issues. And um, I, I know you spoke about this before, but I, I just want to give you a chance to also talk about this with the audience as well. Is, you know, in regards to privacy and digital rights, what is your position on HR 7521 that was authored by Wisconsin Representative Mike Gallagher, mm -hmm. nicknamed the TikTok ban bill? Yeah, I mean, I say let's ban, um, you know, billions for genocide. Uh, let's ban APAC. Let's ban uh, student debt. There are many more uh, productive things we could ban. We should not be further banning our rights to free speech. And, you know, TikTok doesn't take marching orders from the U.S. security state like the other social media platforms do. So it's con considered a particular threat by the ruling parties. Um, so, you know, this this bill proposed by Gallagher is just it's it's an outrage. It's an assault on on free speech. It's an assault on the commons, you know, the communications commons for the younger generation, which uses TikTok, especially uh, to communicate. So I, I'd say we need to ban censorship of <clears throat> of all the social media platforms and we shouldn't be in the business of, uh, of closing them down. This is an outrage. Yeah, because one of the reasons why I bring this up is because even though I don't have a very large uh, audience of those from uh, the ages of probably 18 to 24 years old, um, their concerns are also my concerns because a lot of the future really uh, in shambles if you look at the domestic policy that's being pushed by people like a Mike Gallagher, a Joe Biden, um, you know, and, uh, you know, not to mention, you know, the the Republican Party as well uh, in tandem with the Democratic Party. So I think this is one of the things that a lot of us are, are focused on is not necessarily, uh, you know, it, it's just like what you said, the banning of like, for instance, student debt. I think that's one of the biggest issues that's facing us. Uh, a lot of us is in regards to housing. And I would also like to get your position regarding housing, uh, you know, because one of the things I was looking at was your website and it's kind of limited in scope as far as the issues. So what is your position on the housing model? Because I, I, I look at, you know, nations like Finland right now where they're doing a housing first model. What is your position in regards to housing in general. Yeah, absolutely. So let me just add that we do have a full platform that should be posted hopefully within the next week. So you'll start seeing okay. the details of our proposals. Um, 
and and also I want to jump back just quickly before we go into housing on something you said before about the things that you are struggling with. And unfortunately, you're not the exception. You know, most people really are struggling either with their health care or their housing in particular, um, you know, and then for decent wages on their job and for job security and to have a job that's not raking you over the coals, you know, like like the railroad workers, for example, who were going to strike and then were prevented from striking by our you know, supposed labor president and, yeah. um, you know, and even the squad voted to basically destroy their fundamental right. And they, they have like two workers who are in charge of a three mile long train. And it's no surprise, you know, they were forced to accept a contract that they had already rejected. They were disallowed from striking. And not long after that, you had this horrific toxic spill in East Palestine. And, yeah. you know, because they're exhausted and they're exhausted because they're working 24 uh, seven and they're working very unpredictable hours. And there are just so many ways that working people are being squeezed now, uh, you know, not having decent wages, not having predictable hours, having crazy unstable scheduling so that you can never really structure your life. Um, you know, not not having health care. I mean, not having benefits. And and Joe Biden touts, you know, oh, we've created lots of jobs, but let's look at the kinds of jobs. These are totally unlivable jobs. Uh, and then there's all the, you know, invisible unemployed as well. So, you know, this is BS. Bidenomics is not doing it for us and especially not for working people. And, um, you know, it's, it's it's a crime. So, you know, I just want to uh, marvel that you're able to do everything that you're able to do while you are dealing with an eviction crisis, basically, and a housing crisis and a healthier healthcare crisis all in one. I mean, it's just amazing that you're able to do the journalism that you do. And so this is just a big shout out and a big thank you for being a really important voice especially as someone who's struggling because your so many voices and people who are in struggle never have the you know never have the capacity to keep it together you know to be fighting the power you know while you fight for your survival you're also fighting the power and that's just so admirable and that's kind of like an example to us all that's what we all have to do we have to fight the power and we have to fight in coalition. And so I just want to give big um, props to what you're doing. It's so essential. And on housing, yeah, exactly as you're saying, Finland uh, is doing the right thing. They have a housing first policy for the homeless. Let's get the homeless housed in a permanent and stable way. And then we can begin to solve all the other problems from drug addiction to mental health to employment. You can start to do that once you have stable housing. So yes, housing first. We also need to get housing out of the predatory commoditized market. So we have housing for people, not housing for profit. And it's the real estate industry, which of course, you know, reigns supreme on uh, in in our lawmaking bodies uh, in state capitals and in uh, in Washington D.C., you know you have housing policy basically serving the interests of wealthy financial real estate interests. So that now one of the crises in housing is that big uh, big capital is buying up single family homes and yeah. converting it all into a rental market, which then you know. It all, you know, helps drive up prices, and we're watching prices skyrocket. There are so many solutions to this. It's just BS to pretend that there are no good solutions. There are lots of good solutions, and they all need to be implemented. And that's everything from uh, n rent control, so that um, prices cannot skyrocket, to um, you know, to developing quality uh, quality so-called social housing, you know, one time called public housing, this should be quality housing, mixed income housing, stable housing, where you don't get, you know, pushed out the minute you have a stable job and a decent income. We need to be building communities for the long haul, um, you know, and, you know, communities that are in harmony. So we, we're not contributing to suburban sprawl and we're building housing along with transportation so that we have public transportation that's undergirding uh, the development of housing. So all the reasons that are used to push back against housing development can be addressed. These are not reasons uh, not to go forward and build this. It's also um, 
financially feasible and models in Austria and uh, Finland have shown that this is feasible. It saves us money in the long run to do this right. So those are some of the details on, on our housing policy. You know, I think we also need a tenant bill of rights so that you can't have these, you know, evictions uh, that against which people have no protection. And to be evicting people because you want to jack up the prices, you know, that's like two sins right there. We shouldn't be allowing the prices to skyrocket in the first place. And we shouldn't be allowing people to be evicted. I mean, eviction is a huge crisis. It is a health crisis unto itself. And there are yeah. all kinds of, you know, illness and mortality that goes up with evictions. Homelessness and evictions are at, I know homelessness is an all-time high. I think evictions are way up there right now as well. So this is, again, I think another sign that we are really beyond the pale right now in what our predatory uh, ruling parties have been allowed to get away with because there are two of them and they kind of, they don't allow us a choice. And, you know, this is much of the motivation why, why we're running. And in my view, this is like a perfect storm for overthrowing corporate rule, for overthrowing empire and oligarchy, whose days are numbered, uh, who are not only creating catastrophe after catastrophe in foreign policy, but who are also um, impoverishing us, consumes half of our congressional budget, and um, uh, uh, endangering us by initiating conflict after conflict uh, in, in uh, the foreign sphere. Yeah, of course. And, you know, a lot of these companies uh, in regards to the, the buying up of homes, a lot of them are especially companies that are private equity companies that are purchasing a lot of the homes that are going that really should be lived in within the United States. Uh, would you push for a bill that would outlaw private equity from owning things like homes? healthcare facilities and educational institutions? Um, uh, I'll give a qualified yes to that just because I want to sort of, you know, um, uh, clarify what that bill would be. But in principle, absolutely yes, that our basic necessities of life should not be uh, commodified and should not leave us, you know, just high and dry and subject to exploitation with no end in sight. And that's kind of the way things are going right now. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, now, as far as my next question goes, and I, I know the answer to this question, but I want my audience to hear the answer to this question. Uh, just shifting gears now, um, especially to, uh, especially to those of us who are in marginalized communities, especially those of us who are black people. Um, those of us who are American descendants of slaves uh, have been asking for reparations for well over a hundred years, especially since the promise by General Sherman for reparations. Do you support reparations for American descendants of slaves? Absolutely, yes. This is a debt owed, um, the debt you know, for the labor and also the confinement and the, um, you know, and, and the imprisonment and living lives of enslavement. I mean, there's a debt owed. Um, the backbone of our economy for the first, you know, 100, 200 years, whatever, you know, was cotton and sugar and was really on the backs of enslaved persons who were really the um, the engine of that economy and that prosperity, which established many of the wealthiest families in uh, in America. And this is a debt that uh, that is owed and that needs to be paid. And it didn't end with you know with the abolition of slavery because then you had lynching, you had Jim Crow, and you had uh, redlining and segregation and uh, white supremacy in various forms. So people 
are owed, enslaved persons are owed, or the descendants of enslaved persons. You know, it's like economic disparities are off the chart, racial disparities in the economy, um, whereby, you know, the average African-American household has something like 10% of the wealth of the average uh, Caucasian household. So these are these are huge disparities. They're not small and they're passed on from generation to generation because there's a vicious cycle that's built in here. If you're in a poor community and you have low quality housing and you've been subject to redlining and, and disinvestment, uh, you don't have a, go a good school system because school systems are built on the property tax. And that's another thing that we would fix. Uh, the federal government needs to equalize um, the resources that come to all school systems. Your quality of your schooling and your education should not depend on your zip code. Um, you know, as well as programs that need to provide for greater integration within our school system. Um, but uh, that needs to be remedied. And if you have a lousy school system, you're going to have limited access to a well-paying job. And, you know, and, and the whole thing just, it's an endless cycle. That cycle has to be broken. And by the way, the economic disparities now are even worse than they were in the 1960s. So, you yeah. know, this myth of progress is really a myth. It, you know, and this myth that we're in a post-racial world is also a myth and it's BS. And we have to make this a post-racial world, but that's gonna take a lot of work. So we have to begin by paying a debt owed. And, you know, and then there's always the question, you know, how should that be paid? And I think that those to whom this debt is owed have a lot to say about how that debt should be paid. Um, you know, one point of view is that there should be several options for how it gets paid. Um, and that those options should be the choice of of the enslaved person uh, to whom the debt is owed. Okay. Um, what would you say to, and um, I'm looking at this site from uh, the Negro Collective. They actually did some work with your campaign manager, Jason Call, mm -hmm. um, in, in uh, Washington State. Uh, it is, you know, Jamin Mason and Khalif Mitchell, which I, who I've had on a few weeks back talking about reparations. Uh, what would you say to those who say that the price to pay for reparations is way too high for the federal government? Because a lot of times you'll have people who hand ring about we're in so much debt already. We can't afford to pay this much. Um, and here it says in, in part of the revolution, it says, whereas restitution for Negroes and their descendants in the United States is estimated at least 15 trillion in cash payments, endowments, annuities, trust accounts, or other investments that will improve the well-being of those Negroes and the descendants who were harmed. What would you say to those who say that that's just too much of too much of a burden to bear? Um, I'd say famous last words, you know, that's what we're told about, uh, about health care. It's what we're told about uh, a Green New Deal. Um, but when it's a war or um, a tax cut for billionaires, you know, no questions asked. And, you know, we came up with trillions of dollars to bail out Wall Street within a week against the enormous um, uh, uh, preference of public opinion, we bailed out Wall Street within a week. You know, we mobilized for wars to the tune of trillions of dollars. It's been 21 trillion, in fact, that we've spent on the um, endless war machine since the uh, since 9/11. Was that yeah. money well spent? I don't think so. I mean, that was like the opposite of well spent. You know. No. So, and, and besides, to um, economically, you know, pay our debt puts money into the hands of families that need to spend that money. So you can think of it as one gigantic, um, you know, economic recovery program for, you know, for the whole country. So I think there are many arguments to dispute that. And that's what we always hear against social programs of any sort that we can't afford it. Who's we that can't afford it? You know, it's it's the predator state, it's the billionaires, it's the economic elites. They can't afford it because it requires them to pay up. You know, we could afford it when it was them that was hoarding those trillions of dollars. This is money that was earned 
uh, and then was hoarded by those who are still rolling in dough for the most part. So those who are most capable, who benefit the most from the infrastructure of our society built on the black backs of African Americans, um, they need to pony up through a progressive tax base and make this possible. Yeah. Would that also include um, pulling, uh, you know, rep owed reparations, not just from the federal government, government but from also companies uh, like Aetna and Wells Fargo and a lot of these companies that have also profited from slavery in the past? I think that's a great um, point, you know, and whether it's coming from particular companies or simply by raising uh, corporate taxes, which have been really slashed over the last century, corporations at the end of the Second World War were contributing 6% of GDP in their tax base. Now they're contributing 1% of GDP. So, yeah, I mean, Corporations have made out like bandits here, and yes. especially with recent inflation, you know, this is greedflation is the major driver here. And when the supply chain supposedly at the source of the problem, when that got restored, you know, it didn't didn't solve the problem. So, yeah, I mean, corporations need to pay up and uh, that would be very interesting. You know, I don't know a lot about kind of the uh, the accountability that lies at the feet of particular corporations. And, and I'd love to hear that, uh, you know, discussed, but for sure, corporations need to pay up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so thank you very much for that. I would like to move on to another question um, regarding, uh, you know, workers' rights. Um, I know that you are a staunch supporter of unions, but I, I just want to ask the question in regards to going beyond unionization to possibly worker cooperatives and worker owned and operated businesses. Uh, is there any type of legislation that you would support that would be an aggressive and assertive push for workers to own the businesses in which they work at. Absolutely. And this is a key part of putting our economy on a sound footing so that it's not just, uh, you know, the plaything of, of billionaires and wealthy elites who write the rules right now, you know, through their influence peddling in the political parties that they sponsor and jerk around and, you know, and dictate to. So, Absolutely. And um, promoting uh, cooperative, uh, you know, the cooperative economy and worker ownership as a major piece of that is built into our platform. And you will see that, that, you know, um, uh, an office, for example, of cooperative development would be really helpful, as well as, you know, ensuring that the loans and the financing is there. Because often, you know, workers would like to go, you know, and and would like to go uh, cooperative and take ownership. And then there are many impediments to that. And mm -hmm. should businesses be allowed to, you know, shut down? Well, no, they shouldn't. You know, there should always be a um, uh, an option for workers to assume control if leadership, you know, of the corporation wants to shut it down why not make that open, you know, to uh, worker ownership? So absolutely, it's a very key part of uh, putting our economy on the right footing. Well, this also makes me, uh, oh, you know, think about, because um, shout out to one of my uh, regular viewers, Roger Meadows. He was also speaking about, are, are, I know you're familiar with postal banking, but are you familiar with public banking? Because I know that North Dakota actually has a state public bank. What is your view on public banks, uh, either municipally or stationally? What is your view on public banks? And can they also be a great vehicle forward? And would you support something like that as president? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, uh, North Dakota has really proven what a benefit this is. When the economy really crashed uh, in 2008, they did not, you know, public banking was really 
really solid and it maintained the circulation of dollars in their economy. Uh, small businesses didn't go down. Uh, you know, it really should be the preferred model and it shouldn't be limited to state and local. It should also be national, you know, and certainly the, uh, the Federal Reserve should be nationalized and run for the benefit of the American people and not for the benefit of the private banks who run it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, in, in one of the things that I also try to, you know, and, and emphasize to people is a, either a municipal, whether it be a city or a county or a state public bank would also be a great boon to the economy because it would all, it would create means for the city, the municipality or the state to fund infrastructure projects without having to raise taxes. Right. And then it takes that money and reinvests it into the infrastructure. Like for instance, what we saw in Baltimore that happened over the last night, um, you know, they wouldn't have to pull money from the state and, and from taxpayers. Whereas if they, if Maryland were to have, let's say a state public bank, they can actually pull the money from the money that's grown from the market out of the public bank instead of it having to be pulled from their emergency resources, or they can replenish their emergency resources from that public bank, from the profits made from the public bank, so that they, so that the taxpayers wouldn't have to hurt so much. So I try to emphasize, you know, something like that. Uh, for many people who live in different states where a public bank may be uh, a, a better option. I know that uh, Nelson Betancourt, shout out to him, who has been on here as well, and, and Alpheca Maturity, they're actually focusing on public banks, and he's trying to help establish a public bank here in Orange County and or in F Florida. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to get your view on that as well. So that is very much appreciated too. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to underscore what you just said, that the cost of public projects goes way down when you're not having to, you know, repay with these outrageous interest rates that support the profits of, of yeah. the bank. Yeah. So it, it makes all kinds of things possible uh, without really burdening taxpayers. So it's, it's, it's a no brainer, you know, and if we had a a government that worked based on logic and public interest, this would be the order of the day already. And the fact that it's not is just more evidence of what a very corrupt and wrongheaded system we have and why it is that we need to throw out, um, you know, our very corrupt uh, elected officials and replace them uh, as a rule. Uh, I mean, there are some exceptions in there, but for the most part, they are serving the interests of their big corporate donors and they should be replaced. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. And I have one more question uh, before I let you go. Uh, this is a question uh, that's peering further off into the future. So as we know that on November 5th is gonna be election day, uh, what is the plan post 2024 uh, to harness the power of the people who voted and volunteered for your campaign. I ask this because uh, we at large cannot afford a repeat of 2016 and 2020 under Bernie Sanders where he actually walked away from his campaign and left us really in the lurch. We were directionless outside of his campaign and we really honestly just cannot afford another two to four years of another just election to try to change things. And I know uh, through talking to your campaign manager, Jason Call, he picked up Blood in My Eye by George Jackson, which I highly recommend that a lot of people read. Um, and there's an immediate need for action on the ground. What is your plan post 2024 in order to utilize that action, that fervor that's in a lot of people that are putting their trust into you electorally. Great. And let me just preface that with just a word about the plan before the election, because the, uh, you know, the conventional wisdom is that we are just 
little people and we are just, you know, on the margins that we're not the power holders, you know, but I think that's BS and mm -hmm. it's more BS than it has ever been before. Uh, I think the power is more in our hands than it has ever been to really overthrow this system of empire and oligarchy who's just, you know, uh, a disaster. This is a disaster in terms of national policy. It's a disaster in terms of its cost here at home. Um, the American people are done th being thrown under the bus and the, uh, the pump is really primed for a big transition and people are clamoring for that, especially with these two zombie candidates <laughs> rammed down our throats. It's like, yeah. it's the perfect storm to stand up and demand what the American people are demanding now. And, you know, this is kind of across the political spectrum that people are just disgusted and horrified. The reality of our political system is that there are going to be four corporate candidates on the ballot. That is for anti-worker, pro-war, anti-climate, pro-genocide candidates. There are going to be four of them, Biden, Trump, RFK, and um, no labels, this fake AstroTurf party, so-called party, it's not really a party. Yeah. Um, but there are gonna be four of them on the ballot across the country. We are on track to be the only pro-worker, anti-war, anti-genocide, climate emergency campaign that mm -hmm. will be on the ballot. And right now we are on track um, mm -hmm. and on schedule to be on the ballot across the country. We have three quarters of the signatures already behind us and done thanks to the state uh, green parties because we are a distributed decentralized grassroots network. There are a lot of people who go to work on this and who watchdog it, they've done it before. So there's every reason to um, be confident that we are going to be the one party that is there to contest empire across the country. Because if you're only contesting in a couple states, you may have a very important role to play as a voice, but you're not gonna hold their feet to the fire and you have to hold their feet to the fire. As uh, Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. There you go. <laughs> so we need to be on the ballot challenging power in every state. We are on track to do that. So there are gonna be four corporate campaigns splitting the corporate vote and there will be one pro-worker, anti-war, anti-genocide campaign. When the vote is being split five ways, it's possible to win the race through the electoral college and not have it go to the, uh, uh, to the to Congress. It's possible to win that race with as little as 21% of the vote. Now that may or may not come to pass, but mathematically that is possible. So the point here is don't let the uh, predators and the talking heads and the politicians who have you know, their own power here to protect and who are basically promoting their own self-interest, reject, don't even listen. Close your ears and your eyes to the wall-to-wall -wall propaganda about how you have to vote for more of the same or how you have to vote for the lesser evil because there is no greater sign of evil than genocide. There is no more a, um, uh, a trademark of fascism than genocide and censorship, which the Democratic Party is leading the charge. Biden has adopted Trump's um, immigration um, demagoguery. He's adopted, both he and Obama have been privatizing Medicare and our healthcare system. Um, you yes. know, they are both wedded to the, uh, the, the military budget that consumes half of our dollars. They're both invested in nuclear weapons and promoting them like there is no tomorrow like there is no doomsday, um, uh, you know, at the end of a, uh, of a nuclear weapon. You know, these are abusive, in my view, criminal leaders who have been abusing the American people and people around the world, you know, who take money from APAC and the weapons industry, and they basically do the bidding of, uh, of the oligarchy. And... Yeah. Enough of that. Don't listen to what they say. Reject it out of hand. You know, tune in to the likes of uh, James Fauntleroy's um, podcast and, um, you know, the wonderful independent media 
that's out there, uh, Revolutionary Blackout Network, uh, Consortium News, uh, you name it. There's a lot of very good and principled stuff. I tune into the other stuff as well, just to like keep tabs on what they're doing. But you have to know that this is BS. The public, in fact, according to polls, the public, over 50% of the public knows and says in polling that mainstream media is purposefully misleading you. And you just need to remember that. That applies to mainstream media. It also applies to mainstream politics. It is BS. It is a system of propaganda. Reject it. Listen to the other, you know, really inspired and um, informative uh, stuff that's out there. There's really great independent media now, and it's really important to take that to heart. So, yeah. you know, if you do that and you stand up and you vote, just consider that the number of people carrying medical debt right now, which is 100 million, plus the number yeah. of people carrying um, student debt, there is some overlap here, but that's 44 million. Um, you know, plus 87 million people who don't have health care, uh, plus 68 percent, according to Reuters, that that object, that strenuously reject U.S. policy on Israel, that call for an immediate ceasefire and an end to the genocide and a diplomatic solution. That's 68 percent. So if you start bringing these networks together, we get to critical mass very, very quickly. The biggest voting block are people who are not voting. It was 100 million in uh, 2016, slightly less in 2020. But, you know, half of Democrats stayed home in the Michigan uh, primary a couple weeks ago, plus the 14 percent that were uncommitted, the anti-Biden vote. But the 50 percent who stayed home were also an anti-Biden vote. So there is, you know, this is the moment to seize. This is the perfect storm. If there ever was a moment to... Yeah take our future back and to demand the promise of democracy, to demand the simple solutions that actually pay for themselves, that um, you know are uh, affordable and doable and without which we cannot survive everything from Medicare for all to a Green New Deal. We can do this and we can actually not do anything but this. This is absolutely essential. So you know, this is the choice between converging existential crises or stepping up and fighting the power and demanding that we have an America and a world that works for all of us. So how does this work then after the election? We need that broad grassroots coalition. That's what got Obama elected. And he brought, broke all kinds of barriers. But the first thing he did when he was elected was appoint Larry Summers, the architect of the Wall Street meltdown. He appointed him as treasurer. So it was very clear which way the wind was blowing under Obama. And he sent his ground troops home. So he did not have, you know, the democracy army to fight the battles that we will need to fight. So this is just, you know, putting everybody on notice that, that um, we have a lot of work to do but it is possible, it's entirely possible, it's more possible than it's ever been to actually win the White House, but it's also possible to go on from there. And your role doesn't end on election day, your role only begins on election day. So this is a very long fight. And that's whether we win the White House or we simply win the day by doing well, by progressing, by improving our organization, our base, um, you know, uh, our mobilization, our networking, and there are, you know, some really interesting things afoot now that we won't take time to discuss, but there are some efforts going on right now to help bring the left uh, together in a more unified way uh, in this election, which I'm hope very hopeful. Many of yeah. us have been working on this for a long, long time. We used to have a thing called Left Elect back in, back in 2012, and it was an ongoing effort to bring the different small, independent, uh, grassroots, non-corporate parties together uh, of the mm -hmm. left to form, you know, to get some critical mass here. And that all got blown up by Bernie Sanders. And there have been some fledgling efforts to get it back together. And, you know, hopefully we need to do that. But one way or the other, we need to be movement building and we need to be power building. You know, they both go hand in hand yeah. and we have to demand political power. We have to do the movement building and have the social movements in the street. That's a critical engine of change and transformation, but that's not enough. We have to also build the um, 
the vehicles for actually challenging political power. Because if all we do is the social movements, we will be completely sidelined and powerless to hold them accountable, which is what we must do. We must hold them accountable and we must remove them from power. They have really relinquished all, uh, all credibility. You know, the Democrats voted in lockstep for the child starvation bill, that, that trillion dollar budget program, which will also, you know, deliver $3.8 billion to Israel to keep doing what it's doing. But it, importantly, it cuts off food um, through UNRWA for, you know, for a long time till long after everybody will be dead and gone. You know, we're on a death watch right now for 2 million people. This is absolutely outrageous. Um, yeah. So the time has never been as urgent as it is right now to stand up and fight together and to fight together for the long haul. So I'm hoping we can do that and go to jillstein2024.com and join the team. Uh, thank you so much. Look, and and just one more thing. Um, you know, I, I, you know, when you said there are four corporate people running, I am quite heartened to hear that you mentioned someone like a RFK Jr. Um, from the way the direction he's going is as if he's being puppeted by uh, Shmuley Botiach, and it is looking like very. It's, it's, it's looking very bad on his face because there's a lot of people that are seeing the genocide that is happening. And I'm very happy that you said this is a genocide that is happening because a lot of people are not brave enough to even utter those words. And someone like RFK Jr. really could, he could uh, take a page out of your book from showing chutzpah and being able to look at the Israel lobby and saying, absolutely not, this could not be allowed. So I just, I, I thank you for calling him out on that as well, because I honestly think that there is a lot of misleading that is being done and being called an independent while espousing that you are independent. To me, he's a Democrat with an I next to his name. Yeah, yeah, if even. Um, I mean, to my mind, this is just unmitigated corruption to be taking their money, to be fundraising with them, that is the Israel lobby, uh, which is conducting a genocide, and then to pretend that you are a peace candidate, as if the war in the Middle East is not a war in the Middle East. This is a war. We are bombing four countries. We are bombing Iranian targets. In addition, Iran is now in a military alliance with Russia. So this could go nuclear. This is like pre-World War I with nuclear weapons thrown into the mix. This could happen. This does happen. World War I wasn't expected to happen, you know, but it was equally complex and, um, you know, kind of a malevolent mix, which is what's going on right now. But there are nuclear weapons thrown into this mix as well. And, you know, in my view, you know, I, I think you're more... Um, patient or generous than I am, I would not hold my breath that someone who has sold their soul to the extent that uh, RFK has, I'm sad to say. Uh, but, you know, that became pretty clear early on when he started, you know, doing his appearances with uh, Rabbi Shmuley and, you know, and then doing fundraisers with uh, Jordan Adelson's wife. I mean, are you kidding? How do you get more in the pocket of APAC than what he's doing. And it's just, it's pathetic. It's pathetic. And we need to move on. We need to move on with, you know, with a world that works for all of us right now. Mm -hmm. There's no hope of that. So we got to yeah. stand up. Yeah. And next time you come on, I want to ask you about your opinions regarding Congo, Sudan, Haiti. Mm -hmm. I have so many questions. Yeah. And I, I actually went over, and so my apologies to you, but I really just wanted to, you know, we, you and I can probably talk all day, and it'll I'm sure we could. be like less than an hour, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was a good start, so, uh, I, and I really enjoyed it, and it's my bad, too, that I, I couldn't resist no, just good. sharing all kinds of excitement and um uh, defiance with you, you know, I, I feel like this is the time to be very excited, very defiant, and to really be raising our expectations. So, you know, I feel like we're on a team here in a way. I mean, I can't say that you're, you're like non-committed, you're, you're a, um, 
a member of the press and all that. So I, I respect that. But even beyond like the politics of the moment, I feel like this is a team here. This is a team for social and political transformation and for an end to oligarchy and empire. So we're on the same team here. <laughs> Thank you so much. And for all of you who are looking, you guys can go to her website at Jill, uh, Jill Stein 2024. I'm sorry. Yeah. Jill Stein 2024.com. That's it. Uh, yeah. and, and again, you said that you will be having the issues page a little bit more fleshed out, more comprehensive in the next couple of weeks, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully in the next two weeks, um, there's a lot to it. So it keeps taking longer than we think, but it's of course. It's just about done. Okay. Great. Well, I cannot wait to take a look at it. And then once I have you back on, then we can discuss line by line and get these uh, questions out regarding your policies as well. Thank you so very much for coming on. It was such a pleasure and uh, an honor to have you on. Likewise, James. Really great talking with you. Take care. Keep up the fight. Thank you. See you soon. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you so very much for watching my channel, and I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfon. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much, and you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. Forehead kisses, and have a beautiful day.